Hi everyone, welcome to this week's Football 360. I'm delighted to welcome two special guests onto the show this week. Special because uh, they're, they're two people that I've, I've known for a long time. Um, Darren Letitia is, uh, is a coach in, uh, in Guernsey football. Uh, he's a former teammate of mine. He, he served in the forces as a, and was a PT instructor in the forces in, in the RAF. Uh, and whilst on the mainland, he, he played uh, in what was the Ryman or the Deodora League back in those days. Uh, for the likes of Windsor and Eton and Molesey, amongst others. Um, so he's so played a good level of football in the semi-professional ranks before moving back to Guernsey, where uh, where he and I played together when I moved back to Guernsey. So um, a close relationship with, with him as a, as a player and a good friend, as a teammate and a good friend. Uh, his daughter, however, had gone on to to outstrip anything that Darren ever ever, ever achieved in the game. Uh, growing up in Guernsey, she, uh, she played with the the boys' teams uh, until she got to an age where, where she, she needed to move to the UK um, to progress her game and um, progress her game she, she, she most certainly has done. Um, she's now a regular in, in Brighton's defensive lineup um, with under the manager Hope, Hope Powell um, in the Women's Super League. She's a, she's a regular name in uh, the team of the week. Uh, it seems to me, um, and uh, not only that, but she 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 she's been in the England setup now at the age group level now for a few years. She's captain the under fifteen and under seventeen teams, and and has just progressed into the under nineteen teams. So um, she's uh, she's had an outstanding career to date, but um, she's only young at the age of uh, of eighteen uh, or nineteen, sorry, um, and certainly has a lot to achieve and will achieve a lot, I'm sure, in the future. But this is, a, this is going to be a great episode, um, talking about the dynamics of, of growing up on a small island and then going into elite sport, um, talking about the mindset that's required and also talking about the relationship between a parent coach um, and his daughter um, and, and how, how that's worked out for, it, for, for, for them respectively. So a special episode for me. I hope you all enjoy it. Hello and welcome to Football 360. This week I'm delighted to be joined by a uh, rather unusual combination having a, a, a father and his daughter on the show. Um, we'll, we'll introduce Maya first because she's probably a, a little bit more uh, well known these days than her old man. Um, Maya uh, is, is obviously uh, now a, a, a fully fledged uh, women's Super League uh, regular and uh, obviously a Guernsey girl someone who uh, I've known for, for a few years and uh, as a result of my friendship with her old man. And uh, Darren is uh, a former 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 teammate of mine um, and most notably, um, for this conversation anyway, um, the coach who, who helped to guide Maya's early days, not just as a parent, but as a coach. So uh, welcome to the show, both of you. Thank you. Thanks, Kev. Thanks, everyone. Nice to see you both. Um, so, listen, I'm going to go straight to the warm-up. Maya, I'm going to go straight at you and start off with who's your favourite player ever and why? Um, probably Steven Gerrard, just because when I was growing up, we always had the Liverpool kits. Um, and, yeah, he's just a bit of a bit of a player in the middle of the park. Um, big Liverpool fan, so, yeah, I just watched him all the time and scored a few important goals as well. So, yeah, he's probably... Just Probably my just favorite. one or two, just yeah. one or two, yeah, yeah. Good, good shout out that. I think I, I think we might have had a couple of mentioned Stephen Gerrard on the show so far. So, great shout. Tis, who's your favorite player ever and why? Uh, I'd say uh, uh, Thierry Henry. Um, just watching him live and his movement and the way that he he works and um, and stuff like that. He, he was he was just um, electrifying pace and used it when he needed to. He didn't waste any energy for chasing stuff that he didn't think he'd get a sniff at. So watching him live is something else. Yeah, yeah. Never never done that myself, but again, an absolute superstar uh, of the Premier League era for sure. Okay, Maya, second question. Who's your favourite team ever and why? So not the team that you support, but there's been a moment in time when you've looked at 11 players out on the pitch and thought, what an, what an amazing team. Which team would you name? Good question. Um, probably the England women's squad back when they won ones in the World Cup. In Canada? Yeah, in Canada. Because like, they weren't expected to do well and they weren't expected to 
kind of be anywhere near it, but they just seemed to stick together. There wasn't any like superstars or anything. They just stick together and work together. Yeah. Um, and beat the host nation as well, which is which is big in a World Cup. And Absolutely. I think, especially when I was younger, like 2015, I was like 13. So um, women's football wasn't as big back then, back then, but you can see the effect it's had now on the women's game. So yeah, probably that. Fantastic, great answer, great answer. I remember it well myself. I remember it well myself. They did, they did, did amazing that that tournament. Yeah. Uh, you know, I remember staying up and watching quite a lot of the games late on. Darren, over to you. Your your favourite 11, 11 players ever, or favourite team? You know, from a particular moment in time that really, really caught your attention. Well, it's, it's got to be when uh, you and I were playing and we won the Saints Prio, surely. <laughs> That's you get me mixed up with my brother. <laughs> Um, no, I, I'd say uh, most probably uh, the, the, the Liverpool team of uh, the Champions League, um, yeah, especially like being down so much to Barcelona and, and, and things like that and having the belief, um, you know, yeah. to, to actually pull that around. Um, and, and as a team, uh, not specifically the final, but, you know, perhaps through the season and, you know, what they achieved, 100 points and, um, you know, winning the Champions League. It wasn't a great, great final, but, you know, as a team over the whole season of, of doing what they did, yeah. um, you know, as as a unit defensively and, you know, uh, and like the front three, four, um, you know, I'd, that, 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 that was a great team and obviously then went on to win the Premier League as well sort of thing. So, you know, you... you you lose the league on 100 points or 100 odd points and you win the Champions League and you come back again next season and, and you do what you wanted to do. Yeah, I, I thought I thought at the peak, at their peak for probably 18 months, they were the best team in the world. Um, I think it's clear to everyone now that they're probably not the best team in the world at this moment in time. Um, but yeah, as, again, great shout. They're definitely one of the best sides I've seen in the last sort of 15, 20 years at their peak, without a doubt. Okay. This, this show is kind of has a coaching angle. I've had a lot of coaches on here. Um, and this one's a little bit more, more coaching, but um be interesting to see what your answers are, particularly yours, Maya. Um, if, you are, if you were a chairman and you had the best team, you pick your players that you want in the world, all the money in the world, and you had to pick a manager to manage this star-studded 11 in one game to get you a result, who would you choose? Which manager? Mm. Just to get your result then, so not to build like a team or a culture or what have you over time. Literally, yeah. just take take the team in for a training camp, get them set up for one game to win one game. I don't know. It's a good question. I I would probably just go with Klopp, only because if they say say they were together for a week or so, I feel like the players wouldn't feel as much pressure because I feel like he he's a good like man like he's got good man management yeah. so I feel like we had to get the the squad to kind of relax a little bit especially in a game that you need to win it's really important yeah. Uh, yeah. and yeah he's not he's not won things with with like any superstars in a film he's kind of he's kind of just done well with with what he's had so yeah I'll probably go Klopp okay good answer Tess, who would you go with? Um, <clears throat> I know it's a bit of a Liverpool slant, but I'd mostly take Rafa Benitez, to be fair. Um, I think that, you know, what, what he achieved with, with what he had and, you know, he just generally seems a very um, sound manager to work with and, and, and stuff and sets you up and, and sort of gives you gives you the game plan to, to, to play with and, and things like that. And, you know, even when he's gone on, you know, to other places and stuff like that, where maybe, you know, he's not had the money or, you know, the, that, that sort of celebrity club and stuff like yeah. that. He managed to get and pick up results, you know, with what perhaps is a, you know, a bottom bottom tier, you know, budget and stuff like that. He, he's managed to get them playing. And, and, and I don't think you go anywhere where Rafa's not actually liked after being at the club and after leaving the club. So yeah. that speaks volumes. Yeah, I um, I heard Stephen Gerrard's um, his episode on 
the high performance podcast. I don't know if you, you listened to it and uh, he I talked know. about yeah, he talked about Benitez on it and it, and he, he you know I don't think they got on very well at times. Like he, and he felt as a player that he was being done wrong by by Benitez at the time. But when he looks back, he's learnt a lot both as a player and now as a manager from what he what he did with him. So um, there's obviously a lot of respect from some of the top players, you know, to have played the game. So good answer. Okay, final question in the warm up, Mayor. This could be anything. What what's the what's the, the little known fact about Mayor Letitia that not many people would know? It doesn't have to be a football thing. Just just anything could be something completely left field that very few people know. Oh God, um, I actually got asked this the other day, and I was like the most boring person ever. Um, got a twin brother. Got a twin Maybe. brother. Yeah, not many people know that unless I talk about it because I don't really uh, speak about him much. Yeah, I'm yeah. Sure. Shout out. Yeah, yeah, the boy, the, the, the boy who's, at, who, who's, uh, who's over there at the moment, I believe. Very yeah. good. Um, Tiss, what about you? G give us a little known fact about Darren Letitia that uh, very few people would know. Uh, maybe that was a physical training instructor in the Air Force. Yeah, I can, uh, I, I, I can, I can vouch for that. I can, uh, you know, old Sergeant Major's doing it, still doing his laps at the, the, the well. You know, let's just say you're north, you're north of 40 now, let's put it that way. <laughs> That's for certain. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, right. So let's get into it a little bit. So um, I think, you know, what, what's so interesting, you know, about about the combination of, of having you both on is, you know, Mayo's journey is, is very special for, you know, for, for a lot of people from Guernsey. Um, and I know this is a question you've probably been answer, asked a few times over the years, Mayo, already. Um, even at your tender years, but t tell us a little bit about what it was like leaving a small island like Guernsey, what you like about life in Guernsey, and mm -hmm. what it's been like adjusting to, to life on the mainland. I mean, I know it's been you know very much focused around football, but how has that kind of how has that experience been for you? Um, to be fair, like when I was growing up playing, like I always knew that I needed to leave the island at sixteen to kind of pursue wanting to be a professional footballer so it was kind of a bit of a waiting game when I was back home um just trying to get the what age? uh 16 oh right, well yeah. I, when I was four but, but, but what age did you what age did you know that you were going to be on your way um, I think you were going to be on your way well I started go, going over to the UK when I was like 11 or 12 yeah. or 10 I don't know something around then so I probably got a bit of a taste for it then um yeah. And then obviously, like, I could only, I could only play boys one to eighteen anyway, so I needed to go soon. Yeah. Um, and you could start kind of playing in the WSL when you were sixteen, so it kind of just worked out like that. Um, so yeah, um, that wasn't too bad, like, because I always, I, I knew I needed to do it, and I'd been over to the UK a lot playing football, yeah. so it's not like I didn't know anything about it. Um, it was just obviously like moving to Brighton. Like I hadn't played. Obviously, I wasn't didn't didn't know Brighton well because um, I when I before I was kind of playing for Hampshire. So like there was like Southampton. Southampton, yeah. Yeah, so I used to travel there all the time, but not really down to Brighton. But now it was sound. But yeah, like back home, it was just it was great. Like just playing boys football all the time, um, just doing what I wanted really, just training as much as as much as I wanted as much as I could. Um, that was really good and beneficial, I think, because obviously now in the professional setup, you can't you can't do that because of loading and stuff. So I think yeah. it, it was good that I was able to get like the foundations in, um, and I think that's probably what's like put me apart from the other girls at the academies. They didn't have as much freedom, um, and they kind of went at different a different kind of experience, like playing boys football and stuff. So I think that's helped me massively. But yeah, it was yeah, just like. Yeah, it was just like chill. Like I could do what I wanted, go to the gym whenever. Obviously, had school and that, but everything was so close. I could just nip nip there at lunch or, or before school and stuff. Um, it was also nice in that like, downtime and stuff. I could go to the beach and go see my mates. Yeah. Um, and see my family as well. So, yeah, so, it was it was pretty chill, but it was fine coming over here as well. Yeah. So, so actually, contrary to what a lot of people might think, because a lot of people might think that growing up on a small island and, and being a long way away from where the competitive football is, they might mm. think that it's a bit limiting, but it's actually the other way around and it's been a, been a, a beneficial kind of process for you 
because of all the reasons you just mentioned? Yeah, I think so. Like, if you kind of look at it in a different way, like, and you weren't as kind of resilient to the things that I had to do differently than the other girls in England, like, I don't think the girls in England could go over to Guernsey and, and do what I did just because they know different. But I didn't know Love any it. difference. So it didn't really matter to me what yeah. I was doing. Um, and, and Tess, yeah. did, you, did you feel like, did you, did, did you realise that was going to happen or did you think she was limited in her options because of where, where you were at the time? No, I, I always believed that, you know, she, she was, she was going to go and, um, you know, at, at 16, you know, it, having gone through, you know, not, not a normal academy process, um, which the other girls are in, but when May was there, you know, you knew that she sort of could hold her own and was, you know, top quarter tile of, of the group and, and things like that, just by yeah. visually stuff like that so you know she she was she was you know I, I from about 13 14 i knew that, that that she she would go or she'd go away and give her um you know a good shot yeah but but you but you you recognize that there was good there were there were there were beneficial aspects of life in guernsey that were going to help her in that process to like, like she says to keep her settled in terms of having her friends around or ease of, ease of access to gyms or or playing against the boys you know with with less controls than they had in the uk yeah i mean you know the, the, the island's very supportive and you know we can get to a to b in 20 30 minutes you know yeah. wherever it, it has to be and you know uh, an island or like you go into your jersey or stuff like that it's a, it's, it's a, it lends itself as a, as a, a natural environment uh, as a sporting environment because of because of what what there is here and and and, and stuff like that and you know i think from from that aspect you it you know you, you can get to a running track you can get to a gym you can you can get to school and as may has said you know if where she was at school she she could get to our sort of home sort of you know ground the foots lane where there was a gym and the track and everything 10 minutes yeah. um you know so go lunchtime go down on a scooter or whatever it is to do the session that she had to do you know may was very driven and very focused the fact that while she was training most probably in her club setup in her guernsey setup perhaps in some of the academies you know that they were going three four times a week at it yeah i'm with you i'm with you it's funny actually because before this conversation and, I, and I, you know we've spoken a lot over the years and, and you know i obviously watched May's career closely. I've never really thought about the fact that Guernsey was potentially one of the things that gave you the launch pad. Uh, you know, I, I, we, we all know that the sporting facilities are fantastic, that the, the support in terms of private sector and public sector, you know, the media, there's so, I mean, it's such a, it's a nice outdoors lifestyle, it's a fantastic place to play sport. But I never really considered until literally this, this conversation that all of those things, as well as some of those unique things that your your peers now in the UK didn't get as as younger players. Um, I didn't I, I didn't really think about that. It's interesting. So okay, you just said that you started playing at four. I, I remember remember the kits and what have you that you used to wear. Um, <laughs> I think what 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 I would what I would ask you both is what are your earliest memories of 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 the football of the game. You know what are your earliest memories of how your your career developed and and what was it about those early days that that kind of made you think i really fancy fancy doing this a little bit more um the first memory i've got is i've i've said this this before in a few other interviews but like uh, me and dad we were going to train and then he was obviously the coach but he hadn't been he hasn't like coached the young lot before um so yeah he was oh you might just want to sit out and just watch to see how they all are and stuff yeah uh, and then like if you enjoy it and stuff you can you can go in but um yeah i was straight and i didn't need to watch or anything i just just went out wow. um yeah that was probably the first thing like and ever since then i just played all the time and um yeah but that that would probably be one of the first kind of memory of it brilliant Tess, what, what about you what do you what, what i mean what are your early memories i guess of maya's kind of first forays onto the football pitch yeah, it would be very similar. I mean, you know, obviously, um, you know, I suppose Mayor had sort of been dragged up through numerous football pitches and stuff and 
been in that environment of uh, you know playing football and and stuff on the island when I, you know I was playing and things like that and you know she was always sort of kicking around and and you know trying to do bits and bobs and and stuff and then obviously when you get to four it's like well that's that's when you know mini mini starts and uh, and and stuff like that and she wanted to give it a go and 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 stuff and you know that that was that that was great you know you, you're obviously um it's it's not the norm um you know for girls over here um you know to well back then maybe that to, to go and, and and play the football where now it's more commonplace you know certainly uh, yeah. in the clubs um you, you know as a father you're like oh why don't you just sort of sit to the side a little bit and see how you get on and 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 see what they're like and you know the mayor just got up and went straight straight into it um you know i think we had more problem with the boys at four than we did with mayor yeah yeah definitely definitely brilliant so i mean in terms of your development as a footballer i mean i i often i i, I mean it's, it's not just me who says this is you know there's a lot of people out there who would describe the different phases of a player's development but initially you're talking about play just just playing and playing for enjoyment play you know a playful kind of nature really about the your relationship with the ball and relationship with the game and your teammates and what have you and then we go into the development stages where you start to learn how to put it all together and you know you start to consider team concepts and what have you and then and then you go to results football you've you know you, you you've gone to the very elite you're already at such a young age at the very elite of the game um how's that journey for you been in terms of you know that love of the game and that playfulness when did it start to get really serious and, and how did you kind of how do you recognise that you needed to start to learn about things like, you know, team shape and your responsibilities in, in, in units and stuff like that? Um, I'd probably say when I got picked up by England at England under 15s. Um, yeah. For that, it was obviously it was just back home and stuff, and we didn't really need like tactics and that to go and win games because we had a pretty good squad. So we just usually go out there and just do like what all, what all our strengths are as individuals, and we usually yeah. win. Yeah, when it was probably actually we did like England under fourteen NPC, so it's like the the camps before you you're like in England under fifteen. Um, so yeah, I would have been about thirteen, and we go into these camps and stuff with all basically it is England, so it's all the best players in the country and stuff. Um, and because they've all been at academies and that, they were all answering the questions that the coaches were saying and stuff like that. And I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, talking about, but. Like I, I, knew, I knew the game, so it was I just picked it up pretty quick. But it was all like the terminology and stuff. I was like, oh, whatever. But I picked it up like really quick. Um, but yeah, was when I was like thirteen. Um, but like that was still more development. And then obviously when you get, we don't have um, games where you have to win at England until the Euros in under seventeens. So obviously we had to win then. Um, and but then you, you, you were specifically told. With the 15s, that yeah. results don't matter. Um, yeah, there wasn't so much of a big emphasis on getting results. It was just more about how we perform um, and how we each do our individual roles in, in our units and stuff. Um, yeah, yeah they, don't, they don't put too much of an emphasis. Even when we go into knockouts and 17s, Euros, it's not about you have to win. We know that we have to win, but it's more about how we do it and how we do win and how how you do your your role to the best you can so it gives the team the best chance of winning love it Lo great answers absolutely brilliant answers because there'll be a lot of coaches who listen to this who'll be thinking about what tactical concepts they need to get across to 12 and 13 year olds and yeah. you know i'm talking here to an england international an england captain who didn't really have you know the, the need to, to cover that kind of stuff until you got to that 14 15 stage at the earliest uh, mm -hmm. i think it's brilliant it's a brilliant answer tis in terms of the you know the coaching that you delivered and you've delivered because you've you produced a lot of great great teams i'm not saying you just on your own but you you have you, you've done a fantastic job with so many young teams through the saints system um not just mayor's group and i think you know, everyone acknowledges that, but I mean, in terms of your view as a coach, what were your focus? What was your focus on in those early years, in that sort of 10, 11, 12, You know, before it got serious. I think, uh, <clears throat> you know, we, we we play all friendly games or friendly tournaments up until um, 
you know, they're, they're, they're 10 or 11 anyway. I mean, with, with, with Mayer's particular group, there was a group of them that were maybe, you know, 13, 14 of them, the players. And we, we were always very keen to, to play them year up. Yeah. So when they were year six, we, we were playing in the year seven competition. You know, when they were seven, we were playing in the eights and went and, and we kept going and kept going. And, you know, yes. Yeah, it was because there's no point rolling around in your own league. It's, it's negative both sides. It's negative if you get beat heavily. It's negative if you beat somebody heavily. So because yeah. you never learn anything. It's just, you know, you're either down in the dumps because you've, you've, you've been beaten heavily or you're just walking around actually getting bored. I think more players get bored when they're winning eight, nine, whatever it is, than yeah. you know, on, on, the, on the flip side of it. So to counteract that, we always push them a year up. And, you know, there were one or two sides, you know, I, I, I'd say, you know, up until uh, 14 to 15, but the gap was, every year the gap was closing and closing, yeah. and closing. And then when I got to 16, they went past them. Um, and that was the end of it. So 16, 17, 18, those sides that had been beating them at 12, 13, 14 were gone. Yeah, brilliant. So, so your your approach was about competition, really. It was about giving them the right level of competition, rather than being too worried about the process or any real, you know, any real science or detail behind it. It was a bit like, listen, you get out there and you play games, competitive games that are going to challenge you, and you're going to learn as a group and 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 as individuals. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, they have to they have to be put under some form of um, strain or pressure or whatever it is or to move the ball quicker or to or to do this or do that because you know they're, they're mostly a half a stone lighter and about four or five inches smaller and and and, and parts like that and so yeah. a lot of it is is if you've got to encourage the fact of, of, of the thing so <clears throat> whilst not really worrying about working as units is more working with with players, I enjoy working with players and trying to get, you know, take them to the next level. And, and as you know, as a coach, Kev, that some are willing and open to that that information and, and the negative and the positive of, of that. Some are completely blind to it and they've got it all in their locker and every every game they've analysed, they've been seven, eight out of ten. Yeah. Uh, you know, so you end up with that that thing but those that are true to the nature of it and want to learn and want to get better are the ones that i find do well in football class yeah great answer mate i love that and, and maya so from from those days you know you've had a few tough experiences can, can you can you think back to any times when you know you had really tough experiences that you think helped form you as a character as a person you know through football um, any 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 games where you know the team got absolutely battered, you, you you felt like you were losing a little bit of confidence or whatever. You know those times when you have to dig in and, and, and bounce back. There was it wasn't a game, but um, I was player for Hampshire at the time. I I don't know, it must have been about twelve um, or thirteen, and been going over for like two years or so. But I'd only been going over like twice a month. So I'd be training on the Thursday, then play the game on the Saturday or whatever it was. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, the FA were like, oh, you can't do that anymore. Um, you have to be there all the time. Obviously, like I couldn't move over to England when I was that young. Course, so I was yeah. like, oh, well, that's, the that's the end of the England stuff. Um, so what do I do now? Do I just go back home and play? But then luckily, I kind of got saved by, um, there's like these regional camps in Southwest. Yeah. Uh, so then I went straight on to them. But at that point, I was like, well, that's it then. Um, but yeah, luckily I got onto the onto the things. But obviously there's games and stuff that um, I remember we played the a Marathi against Jersey and got absolutely battered. Um, so that yeah, that wasn't ideal. But um, yeah, obviously that every game, like, unless you're, you're smashing teams, as Dad said, it is boring, like, back home. So it's, it's, it's always good to have a challenge and to play against yeah. the better players and you know, I think obviously playing in the WSL now like it's all the best players in the world are, are over here at the moment so um it's kind of I've kind of always just played against 
stronger players or better players, which is, I think that's helped me in playing now as well, that obviously you've got all these senior internationals and that, and, you know, that they're, they're at the top of their game and obviously I'm still young and still trying to learn. So yeah. it's, it's kind of test yourself. And I think throughout when I've played, I've always had to test myself against older players and stuff. So there's always games where you're learning stuff and obviously there's there's little bits where it is tough, but, you know, you, you learn from it and it's, I think that's just helped me um, kind of be resilient to what, what happens now at in the top level. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. So just going from back, you know, sort of coach, mentor, a bit of a guide in some respects, football-wise, you know, obviously the role of father in parallel all the way through. Now the coach has gone and you're just a father of, uh, you know, an old young footballer. How's it, how's it been for you to watch, you know, first of all, with the, the dislocation in terms of, you know, there's a stretch of water between the Channel Islands and, uh, and and the UK, but also from a football point of view, how do you, you know, are you, are you still in, in Mayor's ear about, about bits and pieces that she, she could have done better? <laughs> No, I mean to, to be fair, Kev. I, I, I you know, I, I think sometimes you gotta realise that whatever your level is that you coach to, and parts like that. And so, you know, from maybe about fourteen, fifteen. I mean, certainly when she was away and stuff like that. It's it's not my business. It's not you know, it, it's not for me, um, you know, to to get involved in what they've been asked to do. I mean, you know, sometimes sometimes it's a bit more. Uh, you know, frustrating, um, you know, perhaps when you're on, you know, the sidelines and stuff like that and yeah. parents are, are sort of, um, you know, not 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 fully understanding the game and, 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 and stuff like that. And as Mayor alluded to, you know, a lot of it is about development and, and not about winning. And yet, you know, a lot of a lot of the parents are oh, push up, do this, do that. When it is, it's quite clear they're sitting in a mid block or, you know, they're sitting in a low block. They're just trying to do, you know, other things, it's, you know. And I think from that, that you know, I, 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 I'd say certainly went away. I, I, I didn't sort of really say much um, about um um, about the, about the coaching and, and and the stuff because I, I didn't think it was my place. I, I don't know what she's been asked to do. I don't know what she's been asked to do. You know, she she could have been something absolutely spot on ninety percent. Um, you know, and I'd be thinking, oh, what's that all about? But you know, that 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 wouldn't be fair on on her or any of the players and and, and stuff like that. I mean, locally, you know, you know, yeah, we, we, we'd sort of chat about things and stuff but I've not sort of been um you know a coach to to get into Maya's Maya's ear and tell her this or tell her that because you know she mostly knows more than I do okay well to be fair like after games because obviously dad watches them on on the tv it is nice to like be like oh like what do you think because obviously when you come off the pitch it's like you can't remember everything that's happened. So I like, I go to dad, like, what do you think? And, and he'll tell me, unless that we've had, we've lost the game that we needed to win. And I'm like, we're not speaking about that ever. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not speaking about it. But now it is nice to kind of have some feedback, like straight after a game, because, um, and obviously he'll tell the truth in that as well. So he's not just been, oh, yeah, you played well. Like, I don't like it when, if, I, if I've not played well, I need to do something better. And someone goes, oh, now you were great. Like, that's just not helpful at all. So it is nice to kind of have some feedback like straight after the game, um, like when I'm over here as well. He's uh, he's not going to push your foot around you. He's not going to be afraid of hurting your feelings, no. Exactly. No, it's good. No, I think that um, that might be one of the one of the reasons why you are where you are, mate. Um, yeah. So uh, it's it's great and it's really nice to hear that you, you still have those conversations after games now. Um, that must be that must be brilliant. Um, Let's move on to Brighton as a football club in general, because I um, I recognise that Brighton is is a, just that a football club and a very united football club in terms of you know the the, the men's and women's teams, um, the the media coverage, um, the focus that that both teams get. Uh, I, it really feels you know I follow it all because of you, and I think I'm really impressed with Brighton's you know. Under Dan Ashworth, they're obviously going to be well organised. They're obviously going to have a great, great philosophy, a great, a great 
club model. Graham Potter and the manager, and with Hope Powell as the manager of the women's team, I think it's a you know it's an impressive setup from out the outside. I mean, how, how do you recognise that in comparison with what maybe some of your peers, let's say for example, England teammates are experiencing at other clubs? Yeah, I think uh, Brian's just a family club. Um, everyone's kind of connected. Everyone's together on the same page. Um, you play for the badge. You don't. You, there's no super so you have to work together and put a shift into to win games and that's what we need to do in the Premier and WSL as well so it's kind of like a, a club theme um, and yeah it's, it's all very connected and together like um, and like other clubs I don't think they're they're too connected with the men's side but as a whole club like with our media staff um, like there's always messages from from some of the men's players saying good yeah. luck or what well. so it's very connected um, we're actually we're not we don't train at the same place at the moment, um, but the our new fac facility, the training ground, is just being built, um, so that will be ready for next season. So we'll be all on the same same training ground, which will help it even more. But even us being in separate places, like 20 minutes down the road, it's it still feels um, very together, and everyone's kind of on the same page. Amazing! That must be brilliant for you because in terms of motivation, you know the the, the support that you've got from the men's team has got to be, you know, I don't see that. I mean, I don't follow all the clubs probably as closely as I do Brighton these days because, but um, yeah, that must be, that must be really a really good feeling for a young player coming through in terms of the support that you're going to get. It's quite holistic. It's not just like one group of players and then that's it. You know, you, you've got a little bit more to your kind of fab the fabric of every day. Yeah, definitely. Like the club, the club's ambition isn't just to stay in the premise and just to stay in the WR, it's to do as well as we can and, win the league and win the Champions League. Like, that's what they're aiming for. I'm pretty sure that's what every, every club should be aiming for. Otherwise, what's the point? Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's, 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 we're, we're just in a building process. And obviously, um, the club and kind of the owners put a lot of money in, into the women's side, which is which is great for us. And the youngsters are coming through as well. But you can even see on the men's side that the, the youngsters coming through um, are really good as well. So, yeah, yeah. it's it's very good club and connected from kind of the youth up to the first team um so yeah it's a, it's a great club to be at yeah okay so just last couple of questions this is for you Tis really and I, I have a, a view that despite you know we all love the game we're all, we're all kind of it's, it's almost like a religious kind of thing you can't get away from it's just just in you isn't it and I get a little bit frustrated at the way the way kids, the, the, the way that football sometimes affects, you know, young kids and the way that it may be, you know, on, on the men's side of the game, the, the boys who go into the system, they get swept up and almost trawler, trawler fished and then thrown out. And that's also a sweeping statement because there are some clubs that do it fantastically. But I think if, I, if, if either of our two kids wanted to be a professional footballer, I would think long and hard about the journey that they're going to go on. I think long and hard about what their other options are in life and whether or not those other options might give them a happier life in time. Now, I think it's clear that May is happy, um, passionate about the sport and has really benefited from everything that football has given her, but not everyone's as lucky as May is. So from your point of view as a parent, you know, what, what, what are your views on, you know, the professional recruitment of or the, the recruitment of young players into the professional systems? Um, I think from, um, from I think the same thing happened uh, from you know the the the, the, the well the, the boys academies to the girls academies it's the yeah. same sort of um, you know the fallout rate is, is large you know everyone accepts that um, you know and it's it's whether that you want to enter into that um into that system if, if you know what i mean yeah uh, and i think that you know obviously we've we, you know we've, we've got another local lad that's doing really well now that obviously we're all cl quite close to as well which could be another call cool, uh, a different time but i think a lot of it is is the fact that you know you're, you're I don't know if it's the parents and the players and everything, you know, you, you go in when you're eight or nine and we, we, we all sort of generally get the fact that, you know, when it starts coming to scholarship, 
14 and they're going to be a scot. That's when they start sort of sifting them all out, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, you know, and because ultimately they, they can't carry that thing. So, you, you know, the top, you know, they'll, they'll carry a squad. But in realistic terms, most probably by the time they're 14, they've got their eye on three, um, you know, and, and the rest. And, and, and obviously that is that is that is very similar to, you know, the academy set up in the girls. Um, yeah. You know, they, they'll, I suppose, it most probably more opportunity to go and do sixth form and to go into you know, um, you know, development football and, and parts like that. So there's maybe a um, a larger percentage that would get to that. But then into the WSL, again, it becomes, you know, um, very, very small. So, you know, it's great for parents rolling around Cobham, rolling around Staplewood, rolling around all these places, getting sold on the dream and blah, blah, blah. But... I, I, unfortunately, not for all of them, Kev, is the fact that unless you've been in that system, you know, I've only played semi-professional football and I know what it is. It's dog eat dog and it, it, it's, it's this and it's that and they'll go through you and this is what you're told to do. The manager tells you this that's what you do. Um, but I think there's a lot of things you know, you're all going to make it. And there's nothing wrong with having a dream, but it's also the fact that you give everything up. And, you know, yeah. a, lot of the kids, a lot of the kids, you know, Eight, nine, ten. I mean, you know that they're in, you know, four, four times a week game. Um, so it's a large chunk of, of their lives. Yeah. Uh, you know, not but, not in their mate. But but, but the, the influence is, you know, I, I think there's a lot of people like to bash the game and bash the clubs, bash the academies, and I, you know, sometimes I'm probably one of them because I see, you know, I've coached kids who've been thrown out and there's been no duty of care to them whatsoever. But yeah, by the same sure. token, there are also some fantastic people in the professional game and in the academies who are brilliant mentors, as good a mentors or better mentors than these, these kids might ever have got in their lives if they're away from football. I mean, Maya, are, are you, have you been able to benefit from that since you've been in the UK in terms of, you know, having having the staff around to support you and, and give you the kind of, you know, the influences that perhaps you, you might have hoped to have elsewhere, you know, if you hadn't followed football as your career? Yeah, definitely. I think obviously the main one's hope, um, yeah. and the kind of the team at Brighton. Like we've got a lot of staff, and they're all in their individual areas, and they do a great job at kind of connecting everything together. So you kind of have a whole base of people, and I don't think there's a topic that one of the one of the staff doesn't cover. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you've always got that, and obviously at England, like we've got some great coaches for for some good advice as well. So there's always been someone. Um, that can kind of help um, along like the journey of if sure. there's a decision to make or something like something like that. But um, yeah, as Dad said, like there's not many people that kind of continue on the journey. Like they'll they'll fall off at certain points because either it gets too much pressure and they don't enjoy the game anymore, or they just, they don't feel like they can reach the next step, or they don't sacrifice enough to get to the next level. So there's a lot of people, even my age, that like they either go to America or they play championship and they got to do work alongside it. So yeah, yeah I just think I'm very fortunate to be in the position position I am now. And I think that's what's kind of helped it as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. I agree. Well, look, I'm going to bring it to a close. Um, I think I just want to say, um, first of all, Tis, to you, thanks very much for, for coming on the show. Um, congratulations on, on everything that you've done in the game. Um, whether that was in a changing room uh, next to big lumps like me or, or whether I think probably more significantly in my opinion you know what you've done for the, the future of Guernsey football and um, and for the young players that you've, you've supported and coached. Um, Maya to you um, honestly I, I, I'm amazed every time I hear you speak in the media um, every performance I'm not I'm never amazed by what you do on the pitch because I think you know like your dad and everyone who's, who's been anywhere near you know how much you want it and how, how, how much you dedicate yourself and what qualities you've got and uh, I've, I've never felt like you're not going to go to the very top of the game if I'm honest but what amazes me is is you know the, the the human being that you've developed into in terms of a leader in terms of someone who you know sets an example to other people and I, I, you know for everyone from Guernsey who's so proud of you for everyone who's had any any connection to you at all 
you know, I'd just say, you know, well done, keep it going, and because, you know, there's a long road ahead, but what you've done so far is absolutely phenomenal, and I know that you won't stop and take, you know, take your foot off the gas at any moment in time, um, but congratulations on everything you've done, and good luck in, in the rest of your career, and, and thanks for giving your time tonight. Thanks, Gav. You're welcome. Cheers, Gav. Well, thanks a lot, mate. Thanks a lot for coming on. Look after yourselves. Cheers. Take care. Bye-bye.